All right, so we are going to get started. Once again, welcome to our webinar um, on this Friday, which is Problem Gambling and LGBTQIA plus individuals, what we know so far. Um, we have with us Ashley Owen today, who is going to be our presenter. Um, she's a licensed social worker in New York State, um, and she's the, currently the team leader down in Staten Island um, for the New York Council on Problem Gambling. Uh, after starting her career in clinical settings, Ashley has transitioned to macro social work and is an experienced trainer, educator, organizer, and community activist with a special interest in examining the intersection between addictions and gender and sexual minorities. Ashley is passionate about amplifying voices of marginalized populations and brings lived experience as part of the LGBTQI plus community. So Ashley, I'm gonna let you take it away. Okay, thank you so much um, for the introduction, Colleen, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, happy Pride Month um, for uh, those who celebrate, and I'm just delighted to see just um, the diversity here. You know, we have people joining from all over the place, so um, that's that's really exciting uh, to me, um, and I look forward to delivering the presentation to you on this topic today. Um, so before uh, we get started, uh, I recognize that many of you, you know, have gone through our Problem Gambling 101 or other trainings already. So I am going to start with just a brief, brief overview of just the basic concepts of problem gambling and then go more into the LGBTQIA plus specific stuff and how everything interacts. So to get us started, uh, just quick reminder, brief overview of NYCPG, who we are. We are a statewide nonprofit dedicated to increasing awareness about problem and compulsive gambling and connecting people who are struggling to treatment. Just a reminder that we maintain a neutral stance on gambling. We are not to be gambling police. It is not our job to point our fingers and say gambling is bad. Under all circumstances, we are simply here to point out that gambling is something that can be really devastating for some folks and to let people know what the warning signs look like and where to go when you need help. So what our presentation will look like today is we'll go over the basic terminology as it applies to problem gambling. And we'll also do um, a little bit of a cultural competency tune up about the basic terminology that is used in the LGBTQIA plus uh, community. Then we're gonna look at the existing data that I was able to find about how, and I'm also going to say, um, I'm going to refer to the LGBTQIA plus community as the queer community, just because it's so much easier um, than all of those letters. Uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit more when we go into the terminology, but there was a time um, pretty recently, you know, maybe a, a decade, two decades ago, where the word queer was still thought of as a derogatory term towards the, the community, but in recent decades, people have brought it, uh, folks in the queer community have kind of taken the term back and now it's widely looked at as a term of empowerment that has been reclaimed and an acceptable way to um, refer to the community. So uh, the queer community for purposes of brevity in this conversation will apply to um, that whole umbrella of identities. So uh, that being said, back to the overview, um, you know, part two will look at some of the existing data that I was able to find. Research studies, as I will discuss more in that section, have been very limited. So the data that we have um, is very, very basic, but I wanted to at least share what we found so far because it will give us as professionals and advocates an idea of kind of where to go next in terms of the research. And I have supplemented some of the research that I found with 
qualitative data. So data that I've done with some key informants interviews from people in the queer community, some information that I've got from podcasts, um, you know, about people um, in recovery from gambling who identify in the queer community. So I, I try to supplement the limited quantitative research um, with some qualitative research to just learn more. Um, about the uh, intersection of this topic and the potential uh, risk factors that folks in the, in the queer identifying community might have for developing a gambling problem. So section three, we'll, we'll look a little bit more at, at the risk factors, right? You know, what is it that may make queer identifying folks more uh, vulnerable than, you know, let's say uh, heterosexual or cisgender counterparts in developing? A problem. And a lot of these risk factors are related to addictions in general, uh, not necessarily specific to problem gambling, but they're completely relevant, um, you know, to risk factors in, in developing gambling. Um, I think it's just a matter of what methodology, you know, of, um, of addiction people choose, but definitely, um, you know, clinically relevant to um, understanding. Uh, potential risks. And then we'll wrap up by learning about different treatment modalities. You know, if any of you um, end up having a client who um, identifies um, as a, identifies as, as anywhere, you know, under the queer umbrella and also has a gambling problem, we'll just review some, some quick modalities that, um, can be used and techniques that can be used to sustain rapport um, and move people towards wellness. And uh, that will also include available resources, both inside and outside of the PGRC system. So let's start with looking at some of the terminology. Okay, quick review. Does anybody here remember uh, PGRC and NYCPG staff, I'm going to ask you to step back from this and let others <laughs> um, see if they can enter the either enter in the chat or unmute yourselves. Who here remembers the four key words associated with the definition of gambling? Feel free to enter in the chat or unmute yourself and share. There were four key words in the definition of gambling. And if you don't remember all four, um, you can use just one. Oh, I see there's a question from Carol Ann Silva real quick here that I just want to risk unpredictable. Okay, okay, risk. Keep going with the words. I'm gonna answer Carol's question. Well, um, you folks put stuff in the chat. Um, so yeah, Carol, that's, that's an excellent question. Um, and I really can't give a blanket answer among all states. I do know that in New York, um, it is becoming increasingly acceptable um, to use the uh, word queer um, or sometimes queer identifying, you know, um, is, uh, is a lot of ways that people phrase it too. Historically, it has been a derogatory word, but in recent decades, um, our community has kind of taken it back, um, you know, and using it um, kind of as a term of empowerment, um, you know, and since then, you know, it has become much more widely accessible to use it that way. Um, my sense is that at this point, that's pretty consistent across the US, although I can't give 100% certainty of, you know, in all answers, that, that's okay. I think if you, yeah, and it, and it is more so by, um, thank you, Dr. Malkin, and it, and it is more so by younger generations, um, you know, that are embracing that. And I think for the purpose of this presentation, um, you know, I am going to refer to it as the queer identifying community, just because saying LGBTQIA plus over and over again, um, might stretch the presentation a little bit, but I'm really glad that you were asking it because talking about terminology is a really important part of, of this exchange. Yes, queer is also used as, as gender queer. Absolutely. And we're going to get into that in a couple of minutes for sure. Okay. So in terms of the gambling words, so um, risk, yes, yes. Hi, Jan, thank you, 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 you've got that. So um, gambling is referred to as any activity that includes 
risking something of concrete value, which in the majority of circumstances is money, and some maybe an object of value sometimes, but mostly it's money. So risking something of concrete value on a game of chance with the hope of getting a desired reward. That is gambling. So um, keeping this definition in mind, um, what are some activities that could be considered gambling? Real quick in the chat, just a few, just a few examples. Poker, bingo, slot machine. Yeah, exactly. Horse racing. Yep. Yep. You guys have got it. And just, I did notice a comment. Um, yeah. Yeah. Erica put a great comment in the chat. Um, that is, it is also important to match the language and identity of an individual client. So if an individual client um, prefers not to refer to themselves um, as, as queer or gender queer, basically whatever the client um, wants themselves to be referred to, we want to honor that, right? In, in any way that we're working with them. Okay, so now that we had a little bit of a review on the basics of gambling, it's time to move into some of the language used in the queer identifying community, which is um, it's fluid, it's evolving, and it is difficult to put in a box. It, it, it evolves so much that I did this presentation last year and had to make some updates because I was informed by um, some fellow fellows in the queer community who attended my training. Uh, you should, it might be a little, it might land a little bit better and be a little bit more inclusive if you framed the language this way. Um, so that's why, you know, things like cultural competency trainings around this are so important because it is constantly, um, it is constantly evolving and it is fluid. So here's just a brief overview of what each of the uh, letters stand for when we say LGBTQIA. So a lesbian refers to a non-man who engages in sexual or emotional intimacy with other, solely with other non-men. Uh, someone who's gay refers to a non-woman who engages in sexual and or emotional intimacy with other non-women. Bisexual refers to anybody who engages in sexual or emotional intimacy with more than one gender. Um, and an emerging term that's been used increasingly um, in recent years is also pansexual. Um, and, and bisexual and pansexual are often used um, interchangeably, you know, folks who are attracted to multiple genders will, will, you know, usually use one or the other, sometimes both. If everybody can just make sure they're muted, I'm hearing some background noise. Thank you so much. Um, pansexual, um, you know, some people feel is a little bit more inclusive. Um, bisexual implies, I think, two ends of a gender binary. And some people feel like pansexual is a more true definition to them because it feels more inclusive of being, uh, being attracted to people, attracted to people who kind of the whole spectrum of the gender binary, right? You know, attracted to male, female, trans, kind of all genders. Um, but, you know, often, you know, people who have an identity as bisexual may also be attracted to all genders too, not just men and women. Um, but since the pansexual term was not really around, let's say, um, I came out as bisexual 20 years ago when the pansexual terminology wasn't even around. Um, so even though I kind of identify as both bi, bi and pan, you know, some people since the bisexuality is still in their roots, even if they're attracted to um, all genders, still kind of hold on to that bi identity. So bi and pan can be kind of used um, interchangeably. And then there's transgender, which refers to any individual who identifies with a gender other than the biological sex they were assigned at birth. 
And we're gonna go into a little bit more detail about the difference between gender and sex in a, in a moment. Um, so the Q is kind of interchangeably used for queer and questioning. Um, as we've covered already, queer was formerly a derogatory, a derogatory term, but since has been reclaimed by um, by this community, especially, you know, with the younger generations. Um, questioning refers to anybody who is exploring um, a possible LGBTQIA plus identity, but not yet ready or choosing to identify with the label. Um, intersex. Um, intersex refers to an individual who was born with um, ambiguous genitalia that's not completely representative of a male or female sex and usually in these circumstances um doctors will kind of ask the parent if they want to um make the uh, make the anatomical adjustments for the person to mirror one gender or another there is an um, there is an evolving movement to um stop doing that but traditionally that is how that has been handled um and then the a stands for asexual um, often referred to colloqui colloquially as ACE. Um, and that refers to an individual who um, does not experience sex sexual arousal or desire. And it often occurs on a spectrum. Um, and the spectrum refers to from ally sexual to asexual. So you may hear some people say that they are on the a spectrum. That means they identify with a certain certain degree, a certain aspect of asexuality. Um, and it can also refer to people who identify as aromantic. Perhaps they experience sexual attraction, but they don't have the desire for the emotional intimacy that occurs in romantic relationships. So that is um, a quick review of what each of the um, letters in the alphabet soup of uh, queer identity represent. And um, I also wanted to share this diagram of the gender bred person because sometimes uh, gender and sex can get can get kind of thrown together and be associated as the same thing where it's really not. Sex refers to um, the uh, what was assigned to us at birth based on our biology and gender refers to identity and expression. Um, Increasingly, um, you know, we are hearing of there are folks that are assigned a certain sex. I mean, and that's essentially transgender, you know, not, not feeling identified in your heart with the sex that you were assigned at birth. Um, so I definitely, um, there's so much on this chart and I know we um, can't go too deeply um, into all of this right now, but I, I really want everybody to take note of it. Um, you know, maybe look at it, you know, print it out, look at it more on your own terms because it gives a really great breakdown of how sex is different than identity, attraction, expression. Um, and it really, I think, can help you understand all of the nuances involved in somebody's identity. So just wanted to share that with, um, with everybody. Okay, so let's go ahead and move into some of the existing, some of the existing data. Okay, so the first study that looked at the co-occurrence between identifying as gay and having a problem gambling was completed in 2006. It was completed in the United States and this study looked at 105 men who were entering treatment for a problem gambling. And what they did is they interviewed these participants. So this is based on 
what men are reporting as they enter treatment for problem gambling in terms of how they identify in terms of their sexuality. So the results were that out of those 105 men with a gambling problem, 22 of them identified as gay or bisexual. And that correlates to about to 21%. Now this is noteworthy because it's, so 21% is seven times as much as 3%, which is the percentage of the general male population that identifies as gay or bisexual. So this shows that there is an overrepresentation of men who identify as gay um, also having a problem with gambling. So granted, this is a very limited study. 105 is still a, a, a small sample size, um, but this does suggest, hey, gay men are overrepresented in this area. So are there risk factors that we should be looking for? Um, and this just summarize, you know, additionally summarizes some of the takeaway points and also um, suggests that cultural competency is really important among staff and clinicians um, when treating people for a gambling problem because um, possibly we have roughly one in five of them, you know, could be um, identified as gay or bisexual. And it also speaks to the importance of incorporating uh, gambling screenings when working um, with the queer identifying community. Uh, shameless plug, your local PGRC can talk to you about, um, about how to implement uh, gambling screenings um, into your agency, into your practice, um, and we will have the contact information for all of the local PGRCs at the end if you're not connected with your local PGRC already. Okay, so the second study of LGBT identifying individuals um, was done a little bit differently. So it was done in Australia. It was a little bit of a smaller sample size. Um, there were 69 participants. And this was a survey that went out to individuals who had, had previously identified as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. And it was an online survey. So um, it was kind of the opposite methodology of the study that was done before, which looked at people entering um, treatment for problem gambling and asking about their sexual identity. This one was surveying folks who um, already had identified that they were lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender, and asked them about gambling behavior. So here's the results of this study. So, and this is a breakdown. Oh, there were, there were two folks in the study that identified as intersex as well. So here's the breakdown of how the respondents had previously identified in terms of their orientation. Um, so you have 44 um, gay or bisexual men, about 64%, so almost two thirds gay and bisexual men. Um, about 30% of the respondents I identified as lesbian or bisexual women. Um, and then you have uh, roughly 3% identified as transgender and 3% um, as intersex or non-binary. So that's a little bit about who responded to, uh, to the survey. And in terms of the gambling specific respondents, here were some of the um, major findings of this study. So 14 of the 69 individuals so again, roughly 20%, interesting, you know, how the percentages were, were about the same, uh, met criteria for gambling disorder based on their responses. And a couple of other um, interesting uh, themes that came up is uh, they identified that um, hub games or slot games, um, you know, games of, of chance that are a slot machine or resemble slot machines, 
represented um, almost 60% of the respondents reported participating in these pub and slot games. And about 43% uh, reported using scratch offs. So out of all of the types of gambling, those were the two most common, commonly reported um, that the queer identifying folks engaged in. Another question the survey asked was, how much do you spend on gambling per month? And here was the range, as low as a dollar, as high as $3,000 per month. The most common reasons for why do you gamble were because it's fun and because I like the feeling. And some other reasons for gambling include to cope with stress, to enhance mood, and to enhance socialization. So those were some of the core findings that came from that study. And some of the takeaways from that, again, still showing that it's important um, to, screen, um, to screen queer identifying individuals um, for gambling problems. The reported reasons for gambling were actually pretty similar to the general population. Um, a lot of people surveyed in the general population report similar reasons uh, for engaging in gambling. And it also su supported uh, the suggestion that th there is a need for gambling free coping support and socialization for queer identifying individuals available in the community. Um, fun and recreation, you know, still came up as, as a common reason to gamble. So, um, you know, just as those of us who are on kind of the macro level of this field, you know, looking at um, social norms and other social supports available, this applies to um, LGBTQIA plus folks as well. So there are some limitations, you know, with this data that I just presented. Um, we have low sample sizes. One had 105 people, one had 69 people. Those are very low sample sizes. Um, so that is a limitation. Much more research would be done um, to be able to draw broad conclusions from this. Um, but again, we wanted to share it anyway, just so um, you know what is out there, right? Um, there was also a heavily white sample population. Um, I know I didn't break down the um, ethnicity in, in, the, in um, the slides previous, the slides previously, um, but you know, in, in the discussion section of the research studies, um, it did mention that, you know, that there was a heavily white sample population. Furthermore, women, transgender folks, um, and non-binary and intersex folks were all underrepresented. Um, only two uh, transgender folks, only two intersex folks were asked about problem gambling, you know, and, 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 and women, you know, I think it was only 20 or so, you know, were part of this data. So if research continues, um, you know, we would really advocate for more looking at uh, queer identifying non-men, um, because really the majority of the data that we got was on gay and bisexual white men. You know, and another lim limitation is that sex sexual orientation was not assessed with a standard instrument. Um, you know, it was it was based on the direct report. Um, you know, of the person um, simply saying, "Yes, this is my identity." So those are all of the represent the, the limitations that you know we're hoping if there's future research on this topic. Um, which there absolutely should be, and I hope is still going on, that these limitations will be addressed and some of these gaps will be filled in future data. So here's a little bit about some of the qualitative data that I got, some additional sources of information. Um, you know, keep, this is not evidence-based, this is not, not research-based, this is solely anecdotal, but I think it's still useful since we're just at the beginning of learning about this topic, it's, it's important to get information you know, from wherever we can. So this might help supplement some of the limited research that we found. So um, many of you may be familiar with the All Bets Are Off uh, podcast. There was an episode um, in season two, it was ep episode seven, where the host had interviewed a gay man from the UK who was in recovery from a gambling problem. And he was asked, you know, what 
are, do, do you think, you know, that people who are, um, people who are gay or lesbian or transgender, like, do, do you think that people in your community are at higher risk for this? And, and if so, why? Um, and a there were a couple of things um, he noted um, that, that, that I thought were uh, worth incorporating into this presentation. One thing he spoke of was that he knew a couple of other gay men who struggled with gambling addiction or other addictions and reported that they were hesitant to seek treatment um, because they had unsupportive coming out experiences for their sexuality. And, you know, revealing that you have an addiction is something that's very vulnerable. Um, and he was saying that it's possible that if somebody had an unsupportive coming out experience from their sexuality, that they have a lot of kind of like traumatic scars and hesitancy about revealing something really personal that there's stigma around and then being judged. So I thought that was interesting that there's a possibility, you know, if somebody had a coming out um, process that was unsupportive, they'd be reluctant to seek help and like display vulnerability in other ways. So I thought that was interesting. You know, he did also mention that um, because of other risk factors, um, you know, many of them due to things such as discrimination and internalized shame, you know, there, there may be, you know, a, uh, a predisposition, particularly for people that grew up in um, homophobic or transphobic uh, communities, there, there may be um, just a, predis a predisposition due to those risk factors. And he also um, did make the point that um, lesbian, um, bisexual, and trans women are definitely underserved, not only in the research, but in the amount of gambling specific treatment options that are available. That it can sometimes feel a little feel uncomfortable um, for queer women to show up in spaces that are mostly filled with heterosexual men for for treatment. So he did acknowledge acknowledge that too, um, which I thought was interesting. Um, so I did a couple of um, key informant interviews with um, both um, individuals um, in the queer identifying community and clinicians um, who have a lot of experience um, working with uh, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender folks. And here are some of the themes that came up in my key informant interviews. So one thing that came up, you know, I interviewed, I had a conversation with two lesbian women who are now in their 50s. And they were saying that it said, oh yeah, you know, back in the days, you know, in the 90s and 80s, before there were, you know, all of these like safe community spaces um, for lesbian women, casinos were like looked at as like a safe or neutral place, meaning they talked about, they were like, you could go to the casino and nobody cares that, you know, we're, you know, we're a female couple or, or nobody cares that we have a gender presentation that's kind of androgynous. Um, they're basically like nobody harasses you at the casino. Everybody's there to just kind of get zeroed into their game and have a good time. And um, people kind of mind your business. So I thought that was really, really interesting that the casino sp specifically was looked at a place where, you know, even if it wasn't explicitly safe, it was kind of neutral. Like, all right, if, I go, if we go to the casino, people aren't gonna harass us, they're just minding their own business. And, you know, also as patrons of a casino, um, you know, people of all types are often um, sometimes treated like royalty, right? Because they want you to stay, they wanna buy you drinks, right? They want you to, you know, continue engaging, you know, with, with, with the game. So, you know, there was a sense of being um, treated 
you know, even though the, the motive was to drive business for the casino, there was still the experience of being treated differently sometimes in a casino than other places at that time. So I thought that was very interesting. Um, I, I, I wonder, you know, if that is um, still the case now um, or not so much, but I thought that was a really interesting anecdotal uh, piece of information. Um, another theme that came up is the uh, accessibility of gambling um, in queer social scenes. Um, you know, gambling happens inside of queer bars. Um, it, it happens um, on cruises. You know, there are cruises that I know the Rosie O'Donnell cruise is probably the one that's most notorious, but there are some smaller cruises too um, that are specifically marketed as um, gay or lesbian cruises. And gambling is very common on those cruises. Um, and think about it, you know, a cruise, like you're on the boat, you can't really go anywhere, right? Like, even though there's different places within the, the cruise, um, that's definitely like a trickier place to avoid the trigger if it's there. Um, and it also came up that there is, um, when you, when somebody, you know, enters recovery for any kind of addiction, whether it be gambling problem, alcohol problem, drug problem, you know, one of the first steps to getting well is um, trying to avoid the trigger as much as possible. And in some places, the queer bars or the queer cruises, like those are the only places that people can go to find people and like hang out with other people in the queer community. Again, this has gotten a little bit better over recent decades, uh, but it's still relevant that it can be really hard to leave a scene if it's also one of the only places where you feel like you fit in, you know, even if there is gambling or alcohol or drugs there. Um, so that that is an added barrier in some circumstances to people attaining recovery from gambling or another addiction, because um, if they have no other place to go, it might be really hard to avoid that trigger. Um, so that was interesting food for thought as well. Um, so now I'm going to transition a little bit to talk about some of the risk factors of, um, I, of queer identifying folks and addiction in general. Um, and again, many of this, these studies have been do have been specifically do uh, looking at alcohol and drug use. But I think that the data the data is absolutely applicable towards the work we do around gambling as well. So the Addition and mental health risk factors um, specific to this to this community kind of fall under four categories, right? Social stigma, discrimination, um, increased risk of harassment or violence, and increased risk of isolation or loneliness. And I'm going to break all of these down a little bit further for you. So in 2018, uh, there was a national survey done on drug use and health, um, and this data looked at um, sexual minority adults, um, which can include, that was inclusive of um, gender minority, you know, gender minorities as well. So it, it did not only cover um, sexual identity um, in terms of what genders people are attracted to, but what gender they identify as as well. So, um, this study showed that almost 40% of sexual minority adults 18 and over reported using marijuana in the past year compared to 16% in the overall population. So that's significant. I mean, you know, that is especially, you know, if sexual minority adults percentage wise are, you know, way lower than heterosexual and cisgender adults, yet they have much higher rates um, of marijuana use compared to the adult population. Similar with opioid misuse, over twice the rate of use as the general population. While they represent um, a much lower population. So again, we see over representation of people who identify um, as being a sexual minority we see an overrepresentation to them in, in use of, of substances that are potentially addictive. 
So let's take a look at stigma and addiction. So there was another study done that looked at the um, relationship between being a sexual or gender minority and stigma. And what this study found is that there were consistent with the 2018 study on drug use, there were higher levels of substance use across the board with sexual and gender minority individuals, particularly um, sexual minority women and transgender people. So this is suggesting that transgender people and sexual um, and gender minority women are even at more of a risk um, than men who are in a sexual or uh, gender minority um, when it comes to internalized stigma um, about their identity. And it also correlated um, substance use among people who have a sexual agenda or identify as um, a sexual agenda minority to stigma-based victimization. So the likelihood to engage in substance use was positively correlated with, let's say, being victimized due to your sexual identity in the past. And the recommendations that came out of this study um, were just to make sure we're always identifying the social contexts, right? Um, you know, what can we do in the community to decrease a victimization because that's usually what happens first, right? That's the trauma trigger. So what can we do to a prevent victimization of these folks in our communities and b then, okay, if they are victimized, what kind of support can we give them to reduce the likelihood that they will turn to substances um, to cope after they've had this experience? And this study, this was a pretty recent study. This was done in 2020. This was actually the most recent study that I could find on this. Um, and let's talk a little bit more about um, discrimination, um, you know, and addiction. Um, I found this photo that I, I thought was um, really powerful, um, you know, in terms of a lot of the discriminatory comments that are made toward um, bisexual folks specifically. Um, and every identity has their own version of this. Um, I just thought this was a pretty accurate um, accurate example and really kind of identified the potential pain that, that comes with it. Um, research on discrimination and addiction shows that uh, lesbian, gay, and women experience depression and alcohol use disorder at twice the rate of heterosexual women. And that discrimination is a common explanation for these disparities. Um, also, more research needs to be done about the mechanisms through which discrimination contributes to these disparities, because discrimination can show up in a lot of different ways, right? You know, discrimination can be, um, you know, locking somebody out of opportunities because of the way that I, they identify, you know, it can be um, either subtle or overt comments made to or about them um, regarding their identity. So um, the, the data that's come out so far didn't, was, did not identify like what specific types of discrimination are more highly correlated with um, depression and alcohol use um, among lesbian and gay women, but it did identify that, okay, if they're having this at twice the rate of heterosexual women, then there's something there that we should explore a little bit more. Okay. So let's move on to the treatment and resources um, components of it. 
we covered a lot of information and we always want to kind of end of, well, what can you do? What is out there to support these folks? How can I be a better clinician or advocate in supporting this population? So let's start by taking a look at the, the big picture, right? What are the best practices that already exist out of there for helping folks that are impacted by both problem gambling, um, you know, and uh, by helping folks who um, are queer identifying? So let's, let's first take a look at some of the evidence-based treatment for problem gambling. Um, so for problem gambling, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and motivational interviewing are uh, two of the clinical best practices that are recommended in treating problem gambling. Uh, there is, um, we do have, you know, for all of the clinicians, you know, that are part of our treatment network, you know, we do give them extra training um, in how to apply uh, CBT and MI techniques to problem gambling um, specifically. Um, you know, so if you, you are a, um, if you are a ever, you know, refer somebody to the PGRC, for example, if you come across somebody, you know, with a gambling problem, like these are, these are the methodologies that our clinicians are trained in uh, to work with these folks. And let's take a look at best practices for supporting LGBTQIA plus persons in a therapeutic context. Um, so number one is to normalize the adverse impact of minor minority stress. Um, it's important to understand the toll, you know, that it takes, you know, on somebody, you know, being part of a um, marginalized group. It's important to understand internalized shame. It's important to understand um, microaggressions and just the impact that that can have on someone over time. Um, it's important to facilitate, um, and many of, of you, I'm sure, already um, already do this. Um, so validating that you're on the right track if you're already doing it and also, you know, introducing, um, you know, new practices that you might want to try if you haven't so far. Um, facilitating emotional awareness, regulation, and acceptance, you know, is uh, very important. You know, I would say especially, um, especially acceptance, right? Um, you know, really honoring, um, working with somebody on honoring and affirming uh, their identity, um, you know, reducing avoidance, right? Um, you know, because avoidance is something, you know, that often, um, you know, leads to the kind of behaviors that we're talking about, um, you know, with uh, using, you know, gambling or substances to, um, to cope, because it can feel in the moment much easier and much safer to, you uh, just kind of forget it all and numb out to really to really look at that. So you know, gently you know, working for ways to reduce avoidance, um, empowering assertive um, communication. Um, many times, especially women in this community, have been silenced. Um, you know, and in in various circumstances, and taught maybe to be more passive. So um, in, in encouraging you know assertive communication um, when it is possible and when it is useful is definitely recommended. Um, again, restructuring the minority stress cognitions based on internalized oppression um, is really helpful. Validating the unique strengths of who the person is, um, offering a supportive relationship, and, uh, and affirming healthy, rewarding expressions of sexuality. This is so important. Um, you know, I've heard the term, um, you know, it's not like, don't just be... Um, you know, don't just be like tolerant of helping the queer community, but be like queer affirming, right? Um, that's something that's that's really, really important. Um, so any of you who are, you know, treating or, you know, will be treating or working with um, folks who um, identify as somewhere on the queer spectrum and have a problem gambling, uh, remember these two slides, right? The CBTMI plus, you know, all of these other, you know, ways of engaging positively, you know, with um, a person who identifies as um, LGBTQIA plus. And here are some specific so that was kind of the big picture, you know, of things you can do. And here are some specific resources that you can turn to 
um, to assist people with um, either problem gambling, you know, or getting more support around their uh, sexual or gender identity. So first is the uh, problem gambling resource centers. Um, so many of you, I think, are familiar with us, but um, the New York Council on Problem Gambling um, operates regional problem gambling resource centers throughout the state. Um, we have, through these resource centers, a statewide network of therapists with a specialty in treating problem gambling. We can also provide information about local Gamblers Anonymous, Gaminon, and Smart Recovery meetings, um, which are all mutual aid groups where folks can get guidance and support from other people who have overcome a gambling problem. And we can also offer additional resources, including literature about problem gambling, uh, technical support for our clinicians, and trainings about problem gambling uh, for community members. So uh, we are kind of like the one-stop shop in each region for everything problem gambling. And you can find your local problem gambling resource center, or PGRC, as we call them for short, by going to nyproblemgamblinghelp.org. You will see an interactive map where you can click on your region and find your local PGRC from there. Um, if anybody here is uh, lives in New York, um, anywhere in the state and has a private practice and is interested in joining our network, um, we're always looking for more clinicians. So um, definitely reach out to your local PGRC about that if you need more information as well. Um, so uh, here are our PGRC locations with um, LGBTQIA plus affirming therapists. Um, I did forget to put Western PGRC on there. They did confirm that um, they have a few therapists who they would trust with working with this population. Um, and you know, now that teletherapy has become so common, um, you know, this is a little bit less of a concern that it would have been um, three years ago, you know, in, in, in terms of, um, you know, there's much more flexibility in referring cross-regionally now. So I would say, um, call us no matter what, <laughs> you know, even if, even if you don't see your region on here, you know, most of the regions are, um, because we could definitely, um, we could definitely help you. Uh, find a uh, queer affirming clinician, um, if that's what you're looking for, if you're making a referral for someone else. And so surprisingly, this like tourist site, the iloveNewYork.com, I did some research and this has like the most comprehensive list of LGBTQ resources in the state. It has like all of the different pride centers, um, you know, and, uh, you know, different, there's some like clinics on there and then just social groups. Like, so this is surprisingly a really great resource for LGBTQ folks. So, um, you know, if you let's say are working with somebody in a problem gambling context and one of the needs they've identified is, you know, how do I meet other uh, queer identifying individuals in a safe space where I'm not gonna have triggers, this, you know, might be, um, this might be kind of a good place to start in terms of uh, social support and networking with um, other queer folks. And that is all for my slides. So we do have a few minutes. Um, I'm happy to, we got six minutes, I'm happy to take questions. Um, Ashley, we did have just a question in the chat about the slides, if they'll be available. Sure. Perfect. I will make sure that they get on um, the resources in this um, this course. So when you guys go to your lockers in the training center, uh, it will take a day or two to load them up, but we'll make sure make sure that they're there for anyone who wants them. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I see some kudos coming through the chat. Thank you. Um, and if anything comes up, I know I gave a lot of information. So I'm going to put my email address in the chat too. I mean, if you like sit with it and then think of something and you want to follow up, definitely follow up with me. Also, if you, if you have any information about problem gambling and LGBTQIA plus folks, like if you have information you want to share with me or suggestions with how I can improve this, I do plan to do this every Pride Month as long as I'm working for the PGRC because it's evolving 
right? I mean, it's all of this is, is evolving so much. The gambling landscape, the fear identifying part. So please, if you have any information you want to share with me, definitely email me. And um, if there's anything you think I should include, if you are you know, also part of the queer community and work with folks, think there's things in like the language section I left out or should change, please, please reach out to me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not the sole expert on this. I work in tandem with a lot of others in the community and um, I am here to learn from you as well as you learned from me. So, um, the lines actually, of communication you know, like. Mm -hmm. Uh, Paul has a question. Paul Cameron, okay. if you want to unmute yes. yourself, Paul. Sure. Yes, I, thank you. Hi, Ashley. Um, Hi, Paul. You know, being part of a marginalized community, um, is tolerant the, the right word we should be using? Because if we say tolerant, that means that the community that dominates everything is that they're just putting up with us and, and we're allowing that when it yeah. should really be that it should be an acceptance Totally and I keep hearing this tolerant, or tolerant, and I don't think that's the proper word we should keep on using. I mean, yeah. uh, what do you think? Yeah, no, I totally agree. I totally agree. And I think that um, it's, and I think that acceptance is a much, much better word than tolerance. And I think what I was getting to in that section when I was talking about the importance of being clear affirming is, you know, affirming even goes beyond acceptance, right? I feel like acceptance goes beyond tolerance affirming, you know, kind of goes beyond all of that, right? So I, yeah, I definitely agree that tolerance is certainly not an ideal word to use because it does kind of imply like, okay, well, I'll put up with you, right? right. And like, that's not what we want to do, yeah. And I, and I wasn't saying you were wrong for what you're saying. I was just saying that I think in our field, I think we also must be cognizant of our, of the words we use. Absolutely. We don't want to further, you know, keep the same stuff going on and on. But we can't help it because of how of how we've been conditioned. So it, it takes you know, learning on our end as well. That's absolutely all. yeah. 